Hello everyone, this is Dr. Shijun Wang. Uh, in today's video, I am going to start a brand new sonata. Uh, and this one is the E flat major sonata by Joseph Haydn. And, and of course, this is one of his biggest. And of course, this is the last sonata of his. Um, this was, I think, maybe 12, 13 years ago when I was auditioning uh, no this is f exactly 15 years ago when i auditioned for the undergraduate program at juilliard i saw the repertoire requirement um i i didn't check maybe it's still the same but 15 years ago it says uh, you have to have one classical sonata by beethoven any from the 32 or you can have the e flat major by haydn this one and or you can play the last sonata, the D major by Mozart. So I guess the last sonata by Mozart and the last sonata by Haydn, they, they were considered at the same caliber, at the same level of difficulty uh, as all the Beethoven sonatas. And to be frankly, in terms of technique, in terms of music making, this is a lot harder than a lot of the early uh, Beethoven sonatas and we can see heavy influence from this one that on the early sonatas by Beethoven this is way bigger and grander <laughs> than the early Beethoven sonatas um, and also uh, the orchestration the texture the singing quality uh, and of course the technical difficulty all of these are uh, in the top level um the beginning um of this it's so majestic um <laughs> right compared to uh, beethoven uh, this, this is way grander um there are two things i want to share number one um we have to really cherish and be careful of the dotted rhythm. Um, I've heard the, the performance of this many times, and a lot of students, they treat the dotted rhythm into something almost like a triplet. And what do I mean by that? Um, dotted rhythm, if we divide them into four parts, the long note has three parts, right? One, two, three. And then the smaller note, the 16th note, has the last quarter. So one, two, three, four. But I often hear this played. One, two, three. Right? If we really break them down, it's a kind of a variation of, of triplets. So here we have to divide even the from the very beginning, the first quarter note into four. One, two, three, four, one to have this uh, majestic feeling. And for those of you who've played this one, um, you understand how difficult it is uh, for this to play this very fast 30 second note with a chord right after an the fingering is really a mystery. How do we do it? Because we have only five fingers and there are eight notes. We don't have eight fingers, of course. And then if we switch, then it will require us to switch our hand within a very rapid uh, 30 second notes. Um, and let me share a personal story uh, with you guys. This was probably my sophomore year. I played in the master class of the great Richard Good, Mr. Good. He gave a, a series of uh, uh, master classes at Juilliard. Um, of course, I was nervous, right? Because uh, there, were, uh, everything, every uh, people in the audience, professors and uh, students, they're good pianists and the most terrifying thing is to play in front of you know a hundred pianists um, of very high levels um, so i was nervous i but i had this fully prepared uh, the first beginning i played a wrong note 
I messed up that chord. The rest was fine. When the theme comes back, wrong notes again. <laughs> so of course, they, they didn't laugh, they understand. And Mr. Good gave me an excellent uh, suggestion for fingering. And that's nothing I would ever dream of. And there's nothing any of the edition put in, so I'm willing to share with everyone here. He asked me to start with five, three, four, three, two. And then here I have I have to face a jump, right? Because next the chord I have three notes. No, he asked me to do five, four, three, two, and then use thumb to play the both A flat and B flat. Use thumb, of course very flat thumb, and then slide down from the E flat using second finger. So I actually only use one and two to play the next chord. And, and that really made it instantly so much easier. And even to play this together and to voice it becomes 2,000 times easier. So um, I, I, you can give it a try if you're like me struggled with switching hand positions. Um, and here, third measure is really maybe an echo of this. Yeah, um, but, uh, but of course in a completely different character, in a completely different mood. Here, left hand, please make sure it's eighth note. It's not, it should not be by any means hold by your by your hand or by your pedal. Here we have this configuration, the 16th notes, but the first note is a 16th rest, and that's a pickup. We have to feel the pickup in order to play the next notes accurately. If we don't feel, then the, the rhythm can never be 100% accurate, okay? And of course, when something repeated three times, the third time must be different. And Haydn put it very carefully. It's loud, so the first two are almost question marks, yeah? But the last one is certain. This is such a beautiful singing melody, and the range is within the tenor range, so it's more sincere and with very good, very, very soft left hand accompaniment. Yeah, this is what I often tell my students you play the left hand, of course, you have to play all the notes, but don't make me noticing any. Okay, so if you uh, emphasize anything, that will be interrupting the right hand singing melody. And here I use a ton of arm weight. So the notes are much deeper than just using finger. When you just use finger, it's very thin. Another thing of making this a singing line of, of course, to bring shapes, yeah? So, again, two question marks. So the ending of this um, really is not very definite, but here comes the, yeah, that's one octave higher, but very proud. And, and in this piece, like I mentioned before, technically it's challenging. And this, this uh, 30 second note run, this is one of the few uh, spots where it starts on the downbeat. Yeah? Uh, if you take a look at measure seven, you have a tied note on the downbeat. You have uh, something needed a pickup. So how it began really is not very confident. But here, 
from the top note. Yeah, so this is the proudest, the most proud uh, run of the whole uh, exposition part. And, and two more things to add. Um, Haydn, unlike Schumann or Chopin, who would put an individual uh, dynamic signs for each hand. Yeah, Brahms does that too. You will see uh, different sets of hairpins on top and uh, for the right hand and then below for the left hand. And here he doesn't put much for left hand, but we have to analyze the harmonic progressions. Yeah, this is E flat major. That's A flat major, and then um, A flat major is fourth uh, subdominant. That's a dominant seven, and then you finish with uh, a cadence, right? That's to the tonic key E flat again. So this note, it cannot be the same. It should be more, right? Because that's how we play. Uh, 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 like a, a chord progression, not, of course, not this way, and not exactly the same. So, more, maybe not so much at the end. Um, the next part, this really sounds familiar, right? Because that's the, that's the exactly same melody, but in the soprano range by left hand. And of course, right hand is doing the same job left hand was doing. So sing the left hand with arm, with a lot of ups and downs. Um, and then of course, right hand has to stay unnoticed, okay, like a background. Uh, measure 14, it becomes a duet. Yeah, left hand sings, right hand sings, and we can, of course, choose which one we want to give more spotlight on. But then the point is, even if you're showing the right hand more, left hand has to have the own uh, shaping as well. It's almost like they're separate in two separate orbits. Yeah, it, they cannot. Um, affect each other. Um, so we have to feel the downbeat of four speed in order to mm, coming to have the running notes coming in in time. And again, analyze the harmonic uh, foundation. It's super easy. It's very straightforward. Dominant sevens, resolution. Dominant sevens, resolution. So if you were to play, that's unmusical, right? That means you probably did not understand or did not learn anything about music theory. Um, this next part, uh, measure 20, three voices. This is as complicated as a box three part symphonia. They all, each of the voices has to have their own shaping, their own ups and downs. And then Sfazando, it's really not that loud. It's, I think it's like poking people, it's making fun. It's the light-heart, uh, light-hearted Haydn making a joke with us. But you see, the Sfazando, uh, it's within the range of piano, so only a little bit, a very quick attack. And please don't slow down, because that will be almost like you've given out the answer before you even <laughs> surprise people. And 
here, left hand comes in two with most. Yeah, so the understanding the harmonic uh, progression beneath the melody really helps us knowing what to do because Haydn didn't put uh, dynamic signs he didn't say which chord which note is louder or softer but we know this because of the harmonic progression and here I found it very entertaining you start with a solo and then the other hand joins um, a common thing I see is when the other hand joins, you change the student change tempo or they even change their articulation. It becomes lazier. Right? When the other one joins, then they, they, they're longer. No, keep the same articulation is crucial. second theme very funny very happy um, one thing to keep in mind see that all the right hand the last note the two note slur is marked stratissimo very short however in the left hand you somehow sit on the last note so I see a lot of people kind of effect the right hand or, yeah, so we have to practice how to separate. Yeah, left hand sits a little longer, but right hand keeps on going with the uh, staccatissimo. And here, very happy. Uh, we can do the second time echo, but it's really optional. And here, you see, to me, not only because the seventh chord and then the chromatic. Um, we have to understand in Haydn's time, his last harpsichord, I actually had the pleasure to play it on it. It was on the exhibition of a private collector and then I was honored to be invited to try. Um, one thing we have to understand, modern piano, it doesn't matter what's the make, most of the modern piano has very even tones of registers. So the low note until the highest note, um, we can tell it's from the same piano, right? It's the same tone. Of course, different pitch, but same tone. But in Haydn's piano, I guess because the, the copper that they were using, the, the instrument makers were, were, were making were, was not uh, having the same top quality as Steinway's or Yamaha's. Um, so when it's the low string, it sounds muzzled. It sounds uh, very harsh. The middle uh, register is quite sweet. Top doesn't ring as much, but then the low register really sounds almost evil. So here, that, that's probably the lowest note in Haydn's harpsichord. So not only that the dynamic changes, the register changes, the timbre, the, the, the tone of the instrument also changes. Uh, so here, almost like a, like a horror movie, right? you're stepping into a terrible scene, something really scary. Dark moment, and then you change to major resurrection, right? <laughs> so, so have that feeling is that not just the rich, beautiful base of the modern Steinway, but uh, you have to imagine like an evil sounding uh, low F in Haydn's piano. Rest, rest, yeah, bum, ba, bum. All of these details helps us to make the piece more lively. How 
to how to voice this is really something uh, we have to practice a lot for and also to keep it staccato or staccatissimo throughout two questions again are we stepping into this evil sounding world no we celebrate <laughs> show and how do we end this exposition part no ritanuto yeah keep everything in the same uh, rhythm same tempo but then the last two notes really surprise us because we had this majestic We thought this movement will, where this exposition part will uh, end in glory. No. It's a very cute ending, yeah? <laughs> Almost like the, the French people, they're looking at you not face to face, but with a side fish. Uh, with a, a side fish looking at you uh, that way. So. Okay. Um, really, this is one of my favorite classical sonatas and it's so huge uh, it has so many uh, characters and so many uh, special nuances special uh, articulation in it I, I cannot finish this video with the entire first movement so next video next week I will keep uh, teaching or keep sharing my experience learning the rest of this movement. Thank you for watching. I hope you uh, enjoyed my teaching and you can follow me with subscribing my channel as well as turning on the bell so that each week when I upload a new video, you will get notified. Thank you so much. See you next week.